Welcome to our webinar for South Bay Cares this evening on sustainability. Um, we are excited to have you guys join us tonight. We are going to um, wait a few minutes while we have people log on. We're very excited about tonight's webinar. We have, uh, what do we have? 64 people signed up for the webinar, which is very exciting. So um, while you all are joining us, um, we will just chat. Um, South Bay Cares, like we've shared, has been around for four years. Um, I'm very proud of our environmental committee led by Dolly Gamble. They've done just amazing things the last few years. Um, God, from beach cleanup to tree planting, I can go on and on. And we're really excited to launch this sustainability webinar series. Um, and tonight our topic is becoming an everyday environmentalist. Um, we have two great speakers and we will start shortly. We Peggy, why don't you open up the evening and we will get going. Okay, all right. Thank you, Courtney. So hello everyone and welcome to Becoming an Everyday Environmentalist. Um, we are thrilled at the terrific response that we've gotten to our launch webinar in this sustainability series. Um, thank you all for joining us. And um, I also want to thank especially Laura Depos, who has just really been the driving force behind putting this sustainability series together. She is on the call working in the background. Um, also Dolly Gamble, who heads the South Bay Cares Environmental Task Force and the other South Bay Cares superstars who are with us, Courtney and Kelly, who are also working behind the scenes. So um, this is the first in our series of sustainability webinars. And we're really hoping that after this one, you will want to sign up for all of them. Um, the reason we're doing this series on sustainability is, well, sadly, I think pretty self-evident right now. Um, the West Coast is on fire from Mexico to Washington State. The South is underwater from Hurricane Sally, and there's a line of hurricanes behind Sally that look like planes coming into LAX, just waiting to come in to land. Um, oh, and yeah, we're in the middle of a pandemic, right? So as if that wasn't enough good news, this week, we heard that there are two Antarctic glaciers that are coming loose from the shelf. And if they actually come loose, will likely cause the oceans to rise between five and 10 feet. And then just because we needed a little more tugging at our heartstrings, we find out that Migratory birds are falling out of the sky by the thousands in Arizona and New Mexico and the Southwest. So honestly, it's enough to make you despair. And we know that the reason for all of these just mind boggling, horrific events is interrelated and it's all due to environmental factors and environmental degradation, rising temperatures, drought, habitat destruction, encroachment into wilderness areas, monoculture crops, lack of biodiversity, we can go on and on and on. Um, but because we all need a little bit of good news, um, this year, 2020, our Earth Overshoot Day was three weeks late. So that's good news because what Earth Overshoot Day is, it's the day during the year when humanity's use of natural resources basically overshoots the ability of the Earth to replenish itself. And this year, because of the pandemic, we reduced, humanity reduced our ecological footprint by 9.3%. So what that shows is that it actually can be done, that if there are some changes made, 
we actually can change our impact on the earth and we can start rolling back some of these awful disasters that we're experiencing right now. So um, that having been said, we have lots of work to do. And tonight we have two amazing speakers who are both environmental leaders in our community. Meredith McCarthy from Heal the Bay and Stephanie Cochran from The Wasteless Shop. They are going to share their knowledge and ideas how, for how we can change from being accidental environmentalists to becoming deliberate environmentalists in an everyday basis. Um, we also have some great giveaways over the course of the evening, so you will definitely want to stick around for those. Um, and now let me introduce our first speaker who is Meredith McCarthy. She is the Director of Operations for Heal the Bay. And in that role, she's responsible for overseeing the organizational health and well-being of all the programs and staff at Heal the Bay to realize their mission of protecting the health of our beautiful Santa Monica Bay and the 11 million people who benefit from that beautiful resource. Meredith also devotes her time as a volunteer with environmental groups to teach the importance of changing our ways in order to use less and protect more of the Earth's natural resources. Meredith, thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you so much. I am so grateful to be here. It's an incredible honor. Um, thank you. Um, Peggy and Dolly and Laura and Courtney, I'm so, I'm so grateful um, for this opportunity to get to speak with you all this evening. Um, and thank you, Peggy, that, uh, you know, your introduction was, you know, just set the, set the frame so specifically. Um, I am, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Heal the Bay, um, we're a 35-year-old environmental organization. We started in uh, Dorothy Green's kitchen. She was our founder uh, back in the 80s. And she said, I, the Santa Monica Bay was very, very unhealthy um, at that period of time. And she simply said, I am not gonna let the bay die on my watch. And she gathered all of the friends who would listen into our kitchen and um, Basically, they, they made a plan for what they had to do and Heal the Bay was born. So 35 years later, we run um, through our science and policy department. Everything we do is science-based. Um, we have a huge programs department. We also operate the aquarium at the Santa Monica Pier. So um, all um, facing crazy challenges, um, as you can imagine. But um, you know, every day is a miracle, we always say at Heal the Bay. So one of the ways I like to start um, my presentations is with this Mayan welcome. Um, it's called in Lakin, uh, in Lakish Alakin. You are my other me. If I do harm to you, I do harm to myself. If I love you and respect you, I love and respect myself. And I, I think about this, this blessing, this welcome um, often. Um, because of, of this state of being in relationship with, um, with the people around us, with the planet. Um, I would like to also acknowledge that um, I'm giving this presentation today on the tribal lands of the Tongva, and I honor the elders both past and present um, and future. The, the work of healing and caring for our earth includes seeking reconciliation with indigenous communities. And if you're interested in, in learning more about our local indigenous communities, I, I encourage you to check out the Curvanga Springs, um, uh, which is a huge culture center on the um, Uni High School's campus, Wishtoyo up um, above Malibu, um, and the Sacred Places Institute, all with um, thriving indigenous community members um, who are trying to um, really move a mountain in this environmental movement. So always uh, encourage you to explore. So that Mayan welcome, you are my other me. And ultimately, it's about relationships and that relationships are critical and everything plays a role. And Peggy just mentioned this, um, the interrelation, the integration of this is paramount. 
And the science community has been moving over the last few decades away from silo, you know, I study this beetle and only this beetle, um, to thinking about systems and that the system must maintain uh, its health, its integrity. Um, there's an exercise that we do often, it's called the five whys, and it, it always helps us to get back to this root cause, um, the root of the problem. So if you start working on the root cause, if you don't start with the root cause, um, then you're never gonna get there. And so you start with a problem statement, like oceans are polluted. And then you ask, why are the oceans polluted? Well, we use too much plastic. Well, why? It's cheap and convenient. Why? Because it's subsidized by the federal government, maybe? Well, why? Oil companies are powerful. Well, why? Um, it gets a little irritating, but trust me, when you get to the bottom, whatever question you start with, you actually might find that you keep ending up at this same root cause. Um, and sometimes, and it makes me even uncomfortable myself, um, but that, that last why often ends up with my comfort, with my um, financial comfort, with my, um, um, my relationship with money versus my relationship with the earth. Um, and if you were to ask me point blank, is, is money more important than the earth? You know, I would, you know, say, of course not. That's insane. We can't live without a, you know, a thriving planet. Um, but if you keep asking those questions, um, um, you know, we get further away from that root cause, um, it's easy to lose the relationship. So the solutions to the environmental crisis are not only about eliminating problems, but about restoring relationships. And, you know, to love and, and the, the love and desire to protect nature is not new. Um, of course, you know, pagans, naturalists, conservationists, environmentalists pick a name. Um, and even the many faith traditions of today that are, that are moving in the direction. Um, Pope Francis wrote Laudato Si, his encyclical on the environment. And basically the message is, you know, hey, dominion didn't work so well. Uh, and in the path of environmental destruction, there are billions of vulnerable people hanging in the balance. So if we can reframe this, if we can think about the environment as a love story, a, a healthy love story, um, which is full of gratitude, it's full of receiving and full of giving, then making changes to our personal life might be less of a hardship. It should be easier to make a choice that doesn't cause harm to what we love. And of course, you know, reality knocks on the door and love stories don't usually involve, you know, property tax increases and bag bans and, and other such romantic policies. Um, but ultimately we are motivated to care for what we know and what we love. And because we've lost track of our dependence on the natural world, we keep putting it on a scale balanced with protecting our wealth or our convenience, um, our comfort. Um, it has to balance, the, the planet has to balance with, with our creature comforts. Um, so COVID certainly toppled that scale for many of us and gave us a taste of disruption, um, the continued economic crisis has, has touched everyone um, in some way, shape, or form. But all of these will pale in comparison in the face of climate change fully realized. Um, climate disruption with its increasing impact on you know, everything, agriculture, um, immigration, crime, energy use, storm activity, coastal inundation, sea level rise, um, all the, the economic costs of all of those systems failing simultaneously, um, you know, at, at two degrees centigrade. Um, you know, this is $3.5 trillion of uh, in lost economic output. And so this idea that, you know, COVID sent a huge, you know, shot across the bow, wake up call, um, climate change is, is going to be bigger and more permanent and more damaging than we could even imagine right now. So 
COVID did in the first three months, what climate activists have been trying to get people to do for 20 years. Overnight, literally, you know, March 13th, uh, we were forced uh, into this becoming radical environmentalists, you know, maybe accidental environmentalists, but our everyday lives all changed over the course of a weekend. Um, and one of the best, so many actually interesting, and I would almost say great things happen, right? We stopped driving. Um, of our greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide represents 76% of our emissions each year, and 62% of that comes from fossil fuels. So we stopped flying. Uh, if the aviation sector were a nation, it would be among the top global emitters. It's responsible for 12% of transportation emissions. The tourism, the tourism industry is responsible for 8% of global emissions. It's more than the construction industry. Um, a lot of us, uh, you know, ate less meat. There was no meat on the shelves. Um, and, you know, beef generates 20 times more greenhouse gas emissions and requires 20 times more land than beans per gram of protein. Animal agriculture contributes to 14.5% of greenhouse gases, making it uh, more than all the transportation combined. So that was a huge change up. And then ultimately, we lived more simply. Raise your hands if you try to make a loaf of bread. <laughs> so uh, mine never looked that good, I gotta say. Um, but I, I did try um, while there was still yeast on the shelf. Um, but ultimately, we lived more simply, and um, the, the amazing thing was that by early April, with the shutdowns widespread, our daily global carbon emissions were down by 17%, um, and that was an unbelievable victory that, that nobody saw coming. Um, so, maybe there's light at the end of the tunnel. I don't know how you feel about that, uh, depending on which PTSA meeting I go to. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily seem like it, but life is roaring back. And um, unfortunately, the June data shows that there's only about 5% lower than at the same point in 2019, even though we haven't even started normal activity again. Um, so the thing that's happening in the midst of this pandemic is that the lobbyists from the fossil fuels and the plastics industry, American Chemistry Council, the airlines, they, they didn't furlough, they didn't rest for one second. Um, they started the push for regulatory rollbacks. And so here we are, um, Harvard Law School and Columbia Law School have tracked more than 60 environmental rules and regulations officially reversed um, and not necessarily since COVID, but um, since the beginning of this administration. And um, this pandemic has only made it worse. Um, there are 34 rollbacks still in process. Um, and all of these rollbacks could significantly increase greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and there's a Friends of the Earth report that just came out um, talking about the oil and gas companies lobbying to ensure, um, you know, breaks in the royalties, um, the, the, the money that companies pay to drill or mine on public lands, the access to the Federal Reserve's um, Main Street Lending Program, which was designed for mom and pop shops, but the lobbyists have modified it, been successful in modifying it, um, specifically along the lines of oil and gas industry. So, at the same time, where the tax payers, you know, are subsidizing big oil, um, you know, big oil is taking our tax money and has definitely come up with a plan, um, and that is to make more plastic and force Africa to then take our our recyclable our our waste. And so, this article just came out in the New York Times uh, a week ago, um, and so I, I encourage you to to get into it. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's tells this story um, that started back in 2011, um, where we were happy recyclers, you know, we put filled up that blue bin in the alley and, and we were doing our job as as good 
plastics. We made ourselves feel better using plastic because it was getting recyclable. Um, and so in 2011, China imported nearly half of America's plastic waste. Um, but in 2014, the whole story started to pivot um, and China began restrictions on plastic exports. China, China was drowning in the West's waste. Um, and so China started to slow down. And so in a panic, the US started shifting to other um, Southeast Asian countries and Indonesia took an incredible hit. Indonesia, China, none of these countries have a significant infrastructure to handle this plastic, which is almost impossible to recycle. But what the, those countries did have was hand sorters, was um, children um, who you know, could be forced to climb a mountain of plastic and pull out more valuable plastic. But in 2018, China said, nope, we're done, and really shut it all down. Um, and so in, by 2019, the United States is now scrambling, trying to find a, you know, where are we going to send this plastic? Even the county of Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles are in talks with Mexico to see if we can send our unrecyclables there, um, our, our maybe recyclables, sometimes I call them. Um, and so we're now sending them to, you know, 96 different countries. We're sprinkling this around. And if a country doesn't have the infrastructure to actually recycle them, you know, they often just end up in our rivers and our ocean. Um, so, of course, Exxon has forecast the global demand for petrochemicals could rise by nearly 45% over the next def decade. And so the, the future is plastics happening all over again is in front of us. And I know that you all know um, it's, it's a complicated story of plastics and recycling and petrochemicals and the jobs that it impacts. Um, and so I really encourage you to, to, to look at the, this concept of just transition. And it's, it's really a new paradigm of how we think about why we have so much plastic, you know, trying to get back to that root cause. And for a long time, we've been living in this extractive economy and we've been very comfortable in this extractive economy because um, we were lulled into thinking that recycling was effective, that, um, you know, that we could keep using these materials year after year. Um, but the extractive economy is based on somebody's back and it always, always um, has, a, has a human face or the environment at the bottom and under the boot. Um, and so the idea of a just economy is taking in, um, is, is really rethinking on most of our systems because we're trying to move to a regenerative economy. Um, it's, it's only from a place of privilege where we say, we'll just stop doing that. But every time we say, so just stop doing that, you know, Appalachia is, is struggling from not having coal, but now they're trying to figure out how, um, you know, the petrochemical plants are moving in. Um, and so transition is inevitable, but justice is not. And so I really encourage you to, to explore this idea of a regenerative con, uh, economy through just transitions, because ultimately we have to keep, um, you know, the economy must run, people must be employed, communities, um, you know, have to have um, support systems. So it's a whole talk unto itself. Um, so I'm not gonna go much deeper than that into it, but it's definitely, um, you know, a place to explore um, so, you know, we, um, in this, in this world of plastics, um, you know, that we've been fighting for a long time, SB 54 and AB 1080 were the two plastic pollution bills known, um, as a California Circular Economy and Plastic Pollution Reduction Act. And hey, guess what? It did not pass. Um, and it just, it just, uh, went down last week. Um, these bills would have taken on big plastic by reducing single-use plastic across California by 75% by 2032. Um, but because it was passed as a job killer, it, um, it ultimately failed. Um, but the, this, this idea of moving to this just economy and thinking about plastics differently, um, 
you know, I really have this transformative potential to change the system about thinking about whose responsibility is all of this waste. Um, and we obviously made the plastics industry very nervous because they spent $3.4 million lobbying to, to crush it. Um, so it was a, it was a brutal defeat. Um, um, you know, on top of many brutal defeats in this last, um, you know, several months. Um, but we must never forget that this is a love story and we must not despair. Um, we only lost by four votes. Um, and so we got four votes shy of the 41 that passed, which means there was quite a bit of support for it. So now looking forward, we're bringing the plastics pollution fight to the people. And earlier this year, um, you know, we gathered 870,000 signatures with a bunch of other organizations um, to qualify a plastic pollution reduction measure for the 2022 ballot. So in 2022, California voters will vote on the California Recycling and Plastic Pollution Reduction Act. And this measure is gonna reduce plastic pollution through source reduction, funding mechanisms, polystyrene ban, and a bunch of other tools. Um, but ultimately, it will give us the voters the, uh, this opportunity to hold the plastics industry accountable. So lots of work to be done, but I, um, I, I think that there's always hope. There's always hope. Um, and one of the, the thing that gives me hope is, you know, Coastal Cleanup Day, we stood um, in over the summer like, oh no, we've been doing Coastal Cleanup Day for 32 years. How are we not gonna do Coastal Cleanup Day? Um, so instead of a, a one day, we decided to make it a whole month um, instead of going to a table and registering uh, at your local beach. We encourage everybody to get their own stuff together, grab some tongs, tongs are my new favorite cleanup um, tool and uh, you know, an old bread bag of some kind, something laying around your house and, and do a, a cleanup. We started the first week with starting in the mountains, the second week was in the neighborhoods, and this third week that starts uh, this weekend um, at the beaches. And so I encourage you, there's lots of great programming around it. We are doing a panel on Tuesday night um, from source to see a deep dive into trash-free water. So um, a big conversation with the county, um, with a bunch of organizations about um, plastic. Um, and I talked to my dear friend, Dana Murray, who is uh, the city of Manhattan Beach environmental officer. And she gave me, I said, oh, what should I make sure to tell everybody? And she sent me like an 80 page email. So there is a lot of amazing stuff happening um, in the South Beach cities. And it was so much stuff I actually didn't. I'm, I'm gonna send it to, um, um, I'll send it to the team to see if we can um, get some, get you guys, make sure you guys all have this information. But the Manhattan Beach Climate Action uh, and Adaptation Plan uh, is been a, a really a, something to behold. Um, the, the beach, sorry, the beach, uh, the dune restoration that's happening with the Bay Foundation uh, is going on um, to protect the city from you know sea level rise that's going to be a really powerful project you can see the the one that's happening up north of you um, at Annenberg and how they've been able to actually make beach um, and how the native plants are thriving so it's really a, a remarkable thing so the pilot continues down into Manhattan Beach um, there's a stormwater infiltration projects in November they're going to present the new sea level rise maps um, to city council so I encourage you to track to, uh, to make sure you check those out. Um, the 100% renewable energy for your home through the Clean Power Alliance. Um, and there's a whole host of really exciting, uh, the beach cities have um, city curbside food waste programs and Manhattan Beach and Redondo Beach are similar, um, but really it's about putting your all your organics in your green bins, not just your yard cuppings, but that's eggs, bones, all the oily stuff that you can't put in most composters um, can actually go into your green bin. So um, I really encourage you to check that out um, with the city. So that's Dana's information up there. Uh, I know most of this is um, on, on your city website, but um, it's, it's, it's beautiful to see so many things happening. So 
That is all the news that fits to print. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, and please reach out and let me know what, uh, what's happening in your world. I'd love to continue the conversation. Okay, thank you so much, Meredith. That was really, um, really informative and, um, and inspiring. I think that characterizing our relationship with the environment as a love story is really a fantastic way to think about it. And as you said, it makes taking a lot of actions so much more um, natural to do because it's, some, it's, it's taking an action for some thing that we care deeply about. So that having been said, it's time for our very first giveaway. And um, the first giveaway is in um, a Heal the Bay t-shirt, like the one that Meredith is wearing, and a Heal the Bay tote bag to go with it. And so to do this giveaway, we have this wheel, spinner wheel, number picker wheel. We have a number for everyone who's in attendance and we're gonna spin the wheel. And just see where it ends up. And it's lucky number 12. So now our behind the scenes, Courtney or Dolly are going to figure out who lucky number 12 is to get our first giveaway prize. So Dominique, yay, you get the Heal the Bay t-shirt and tote bag. So we will um, reach out to you by email and um, Heal the Bay will send that directly to you. So you should uh, be hearing from us to get your address. So now we're going to turn uh, to our second speaker of the evening. And this is Stephanie Cochran, who is the owner and the founder of The Wasteless Shop in Manhattan Beach. Stephanie was practicing as a dental hygienist when she realized she could make a much bigger impact by helping the health of the planet. So uh, she has, since she has uh, joined us in Manhattan Beach, quickly earned a reputation as a local sustainability guide who is happy to share facts and tips and insights into environmental problems and um, help each of us to make more environmentally sound choices uh, simply by reducing our waste that we are um, putting back into our planet and at her fabulous Wasteless shop. These choices are easy to make. So Stephanie, welcome and thank you for being with us this evening. Hi Peggy, thank you so much for having me. And I wanna start off by saying that becoming a feature in the community for my tips is something that always makes me feel nervous because I feel like I'm an everyday person who just has a passion for the planet and I think that ties in so importantly into becoming an everyday environmentalist and just letting people know that you don't need to have a degree to let your passion for the planet shine in your daily life and I think that when Meredith was speaking um, I love listening to speakers like that because it's always really empowering and invigorating in my own life um, showing the reasons when I'm hearing about everything that's happening with climate change and the communities that are affected and the lobbyists, um, I start to get emotional. And then I realize that that, you know, it's important to feel that connection and feel it deeply and not put it away and take action because of that. So thank you for having me. Um, just a little bit of background about myself aside from um, my degree in dental hygiene. Um, I grew up in a rural farm community in Northern Nevada. And I think that that helped give me this natural love for our planet um, that was always there, but it didn't flourish into a career until later in life when I had a little bit more confidence in who I was as a person and what I could do with my actions. Um, I 
traveled a little bit in college and went to some third world countries where I started to see more waste around the world. Um, you know, we disguise it pretty well here in the United States. And I think having those, that information really in your face can startle you in a way that, you know, we need to be startled. Um, we're really good at disguising things here. So I was pretty affected on my trips um, abroad, seeing the state of the rest of the world. And like Meredith said, we kind of put our problems onto a lot, of, a lot of other communities that don't have the resources to defend themselves or to handle those problems. And so we need to take responsibility um, individually and um, systematically as a country. So that's when I really started feeling the emotional connection to doing something myself. But as I said, I felt like I'm just a normal person. So what do I do? I can't do anything massive and huge. I just need to start making changes in my own life. And now a year into starting the business and a few years into starting to live more sustainably, I've seen that those little changes that I have made in my own life have made a really big difference in um, the lives of people around me and my community. So um, I always kind of try and highlight that with people that I meet in the store that, you know, all of us do have the power to make small changes that do add up to larger changes. So started making little changes in my life and realized that it wasn't as easy um, to find products and things that were sustainable as I'd like. Um, fast forward a few years, I find that we're getting more and more options available, which is great, but I wanted to um, create resources in my community for people to find products that were more sustainable. So I started the store online and started doing events like the Hometown Fair and Fiesta Hermosa and found this really overwhelming response from the community. Um, people who are interested in trying to live more sustainably and not um, you know, consume as much single-use plastic and create as much waste. So I opened the refill store and that's been really great. And I've, um, I feel like I'm step, stepping into myself and my purpose, which like I said, Meredith's speech is just um, really validating that we have all of these big global issues, but there's individuals out there. Um, it takes all of our efforts um, on a small scale to start to solve those problems. Um, so to keep things simple, um, Laura and I were talking about how to kind of break things down in an easy manner. And we kind of just talked about going over the basic R's of recycling. And as we grew up, um, reduce, reuse, recycle was the really big thing. Um, and also, as Meredith said, we know that the recycling system isn't the, the solution. We need to first start with just reducing our consumption, period. Um, so at the Wasteless Shop on our south facing wall, we have printed reduce, reuse, refill, refuse. Um, recycling to us is kind of a last alternative and it shouldn't be something that we rely on. It should be something that we use when necessary. But um, so we'll start with the first R for reduce. Um, so when somebody comes into the store, one of the first things that they'll ask is what, what's the first thing that I should do? I just started you know, feeling this passion to live more sustainably, um, what should I do? And I always say, just take a look at your life. Um, you know, are you excessively consuming things? Are there things that you can just reduce in general? Do you go shopping all of the time and buy fast fashion? You know, do you like clothes that you have in your wardrobe? Is that enough for you? Do you need to go out and buy new clothes all of the time? Um, and reducing your carbon footprint as well, just on a little um, different scale aside from the, the consumer side is, um, once again, I keep referring back to Meredith, but she brought up so many great things, but like meat consumption, you know, the resources used to feed meat itself and the greenhouse gas emissions that come from processing it are, you know, really, really easy thing that we can swap but I'll, you know it's it's <laughs> it's overwhelming um if you just break it down into small small daily meals reducing meat one one meal a week then um then you can start making real changes um looking inside of your house reducing the number of flights that you take using public transportation 
walking when you can. These are all things that we do every day and it seems overwhelming when you look at them all at once, but if you just focus on one small thing um, each day, it becomes easier to look back on your life and say, hey, a couple years ago, I was living in a completely different way. Um, the next R is reuse. So there's a lot of single use items out there. Um, single use cups, bags, silverware, sanitary items, um, takeout containers. And luckily we live in a time as well that we do have reusable um, alternatives for those items. So there's a lot of things out there to help you transition from single use. So when you're out at a coffee shop and you see the single use cups, you know, think, can I bring a cup from my house? Do you have a cup at your house? I use um, mason jars a lot if I'm out and about and I have one that um, if I don't have a coffee mug. So if I've got old flannel sheets, sometimes I'll use those for cleaning rags. Uh, rubber bands, if I end up getting rubber bands around eggs, I'll take them off and use them in my garden. So trying to just get creative and not realize that there's a lot of um, products out there that are forced upon us that we don't need and we have plenty of things in our house that we can reuse to begin with. Um, and then the next R is refill, which this one is obviously my favorite because that's where my store comes into play. Um, when we buy items in single use packaging, if you look at the item itself and think about it, there's probably a place that has, uh, or a way that you can refill that same container or a place that you can do so. Um, even if it's making it yourself, um, luckily, like I was saying earlier, there's more and more stores becoming available with refill stations. So. Um, refilling containers is a really, really great way to um, reduce waste. Um, obviously in COVID right now, it's not the easiest thing to do, but if we're just reducing our consumption, generally um, saving containers that you have and refilling them later when things become available, then that helps too. Um, at our store, we've partnered with some really cool companies that weren't doing refillables to create really awesome refill solutions. Um, Kin Candle is a local company in Manhattan Beach that makes coconut wax candles. And I met them at the hometown fair and they didn't have a refill option. And I told them I really love candles, but I don't like the, you know, the waste after and I'm too lazy to clean them. So we created this really, really cool system for refilling candles. Um, and I partnered with some other small businesses as well to refill their containers for the products that we carry. So um, more and more people, more and more companies and more solutions are coming available um, for refills. Um, one thing that you can do on a small scale too is uh, make your own coconut milk or oat milk or alternative milk. Um, I did the math on how long it takes me to drive to the store versus making it at my house. It's 30 seconds for me to blitz shredded coconut and oats in the blender, and it takes me 20 minutes to go to the store and back. So um, when you start looking at these small things that you can do in your routine, you realize that they are easier than they seem. And you know, when on a big scale, it seems overwhelming, but when you break it down, um, a lot of things can save you time and money. Um, and then the next R, is refuse. So obviously all of these themes tie in together pretty well. Um, when I'm looking at purchasing something, I'm looking at the company itself. Um, are they mission driven or do they just want me to buy things? And that's something that I think all of us need to take the responsibility in is we can get caught up in, oh, I love this. I love this brand. This is really cute. But we need to kind of look at what future do we want to see and what decisions are we making in our daily lives to um, to create that future. So just saying no to products that don't align with your values um, is a great a great way to vote for the future that you want to see. And lastly, 
recycling. And I do touch on this last just because of um, what Meredith was saying. I toured all of the um, recycling and waste facilities in LA with the Bill Brand Mayor of Redondo Beach. And we saw firsthand um, that so many recyclables don't get recycled and they get shipped overseas and we don't know what happens overseas. And um, they can be shipped to multiple facilities, multiple countries. So it is important to recycle things properly and to know what you're recycling. But if you can re or reduce the number of recyclables you're purchasing to begin with, we're um, helping to avoid that larger problem. Okay, thank you so much, Stephanie. That was wonderful. And um, for those of you who have not visited the Wasteless Shop, I really strongly recommend that you do so. It's a wonderful experience. So now it's time for our second giveaway. Um, this giveaway is a, um, a couple of items from Stephanie's shop. So I will hold them when I'm back. I'm going to spin the wheel and see who our lucky winner is this time. And the winner is number 27. So we will have Courtney or Dolly or someone find out who number 27 is. And now I will hold up these wonderful items. So this is a glass bottle. You can bring your own bottles to put the cleaning detergent in. It's a household cleaner. And then these are these marvelous unpaper towels. Whoops, wait, there we go. Now you can see them. Unpaper towels that um, every house should have because um, while well, paper waste isn't quite as bad as plastic waste, it's waste nonetheless. And if we can eliminate it, we definitely should. So let's see if we have our number yet for our winner is Marissa Kumtong. Marissa Kumtong wins these two wonderful items from the Wasteless Shop. And we will um, send you an email, get your information in. They will most likely be hand delivered if you're local in the South Bay. So um, now it's time for questions and answer. Um, we have a couple of questions in our question box and um, I will just read them and maybe direct them to our speakers. And um, for those of you who joined us after Courtney gave a little introduction, um, just so that you know, this, this webinar is being recorded so that um, if you want to go back and look at it again, th that the information will be there for you. So the first question, this is for um, Meredith. Have you looked at the impact with the lack of live events during COVID? Less fireworks, less neon lighting, et cetera. You know what's interesting about that? Not the fireworks, I didn't think about the fireworks, um, but what was interesting to me was how many, um, you know, usually at, in the springtime because of the proms and graduation, we find hundreds of um, balloons on the beach that you know people do during releases or um, and this year we found almost none so it was one of those little uh, you know private victories of something that we really should stop doing completely that's utterly useless um, that you know there's so many different ways to celebrate other than releasing balloons and balloons cause damage you know from coastal all the way into um, Death Valley they find balloons that have been released um, so depending on which way the wind's blowing. So um, I do think that, you know, one of the most important impacts was just the lack of driving um, that during all of these events. So there were some really significant things. It'll be interesting to see them sort of teased out over time as we, you know, get a second to actually analyze um, more and more numbers about, you know, before and after um, basically March 15th for, for most people, there was, um, there was a day that it all changed. So Lots more analysis to do on that, but I think it's really interesting. I never thought about um, the fireworks. Yeah, um, that's great. That was a great question. And I think there's a lot of um, positives that comes from not having these huge events. So as much as we would love to get back out of our virtual world, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it really is a positive thing for our planet. So uh, let's see. Um, 
how can one join Heal the Bay and help out? This is a question again for you, Meredith. That's great. Um, I think the best way is to sign up for our monthly newsletter. It's called Blue um, on our, on our um, website and you can check out the calendar um, and there is so many things that you can participate in right now. And then hopefully once, once we can start opening doors very slowly, um, you know, we're, we're so missing being in community um, with people and uh, it will be great to have the aquarium open again. And, um, you know, we do, we're still doing our monthly volunteer orientation and that's probably the single best way to see all the different ways you can be involved in, in Hilla Bay from, um, you know, if you're an education person and you want to help with Speakers Bureau or, or with the aquarium education, if you're a, a great uh, we just opened a new store, and so I, I was just texting Stephanie like behind the scenes because, um, you know, we need a retail-minded person to help us think about our new retail um, offering. So um, there's there's a million different uh, ways that you can help, and even if you're just an armchair activist and all you want to do is write letters, we have some letters for you to write for sure. So um, there is really something for everybody. Great, thank you. Um, now a question for Courtney. Do you have recommendations for uh, when ordering takeout? So much plastic and styrofoam. With COVID, everything is so strict. Do you have any suggestions or tips? Mm. I'll pass that to Meredith. Meredith, do you have any take on that? You know, I think a lot of, a lot of what happens is hysteria and it's not hysteria i mean there's a legitimate fear and i don't want to underplay that for one second um and i you know i at the the first time i did go to the grocery store and they're like you can't use your reusable bags i almost burst into tears because i've been working on the bag ban for literally you know nine years um and so to walk out of the grocery store holding like seven plastic bags it made me sick to my stomach um, and so then I went back to the store manager and I said, I, I can't do this. And so, you know, we had a kind of a chuckle over it. And she's like, well, just put them back into your basket and take the basket out. Um, and so, um, and, but now most grocery stores will let you bring in your own bags. You have to bag your own bags, but um, you have to bag your own groceries, but at least they will let it take it back. So this idea of, of um, you know, what is, contaminated and what is not is is going to take a while to sort out because the plastics industry is certainly seizing on this fear none of this is science-based none of this has been you know researched to a conclusive end uh, in terms of transmission um, and now you know it seems like we're backing way off this idea of transmission through stuff um, because they're not seeing it in terms of money and cashiers and things like that so um, it it's certainly the the jury is still out but um you know we firmly believe that bringing your own stuff is the cleanest thing that you can do and i'm sure stephanie has some thoughts about this as well yeah i definitely had a couple recommendations for that too when you are getting takeout um do some research and talk to the the store before you order from them and ask what kind of containers they are using um there's only a couple places that i like to get takeout from i try and eat at home when i can especially during covid if i can't bring my containers in places or actually sit down but um, if you can find a store that uses like a heavy duty plastic that you can actually reuse um, i've gotten takeout from india's tandoori in manhattan beach and they use really like um thick, heavy plastic that I will, I'll just keep the containers and use them for food prep over and over and for food storage in my refrigerator. Um, obviously, I, I won't purchase from a store that uses um, styrofoam and some, some places will actually have paper-based containers too that aren't lined with any, any plastic. So, you know, if you're ordering a soup or something, you're in a pretty tough spot. But if you're just getting a salad, there might be a couple places that you can um, order from always request no plastic bag. Um, you can just get it delivered with that container itself and then no utensils as well. So I think just doing a little bit of research on the front end when you are ordering the takeout um, and seeing if that container is something that you can reuse later is, is helpful. My kids constantly point out how awesome pizza is. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh. Um, 
but yeah, in terms of packaging. Right. Okay, so I think this needs to be our last question because we're coming up on eight o'clock. Does anyone have suggestions for buying bulk food, alternate flowers besides sprouts? The Wasteless Shop is amazing for household products, but looking to stem ordering from Amazon, plastic bags of almond flour, et cetera. So I have some maybe too early to say news, but we are working on carrying more um, food items and um, looking into growing into that next year. So hopefully we can have a good solution in the South Bay. Um, Terror Grocery is a little bit further away, but if you're closer to downtown LA, they have a lot of bulk refillable items and um, really interesting alternative flowers and um, products like that. So a little bit wider range than Sprouts or Whole Foods will have. Um, and they're local in LA. So that's one that I would recommend for now. Peggy, can I just quick, I know that time is running down. Um, I just, for everybody, the amount of, um, Annie just asked a really important question, the amount of single use um, PPE that we're finding is, is staggering. And so whether people take them off and they don't want to bring them into their house or whatnot, but please, please, please invest in a good reusable mask and, uh, and really be careful with where, if you are using reuse, uh, single use, please make sure it gets into the trash can because everything about PPE is a problem. At a cleanup, it's gonna, when the first rain comes, all of this stuff is gonna come screaming down the ocean. Um, beach maintenance has been closed for a long time. They've directed staff to sanitizing bathrooms. So we know that the first flush is just gonna be a nightmare. Um, but we really, really encourage you to get a reusable mask. And if you do have single use PPE, we have um, a collection box at the Wasteless Shop we've partnered with Conscious Cleanup. So, and we have reusable masks that are really great and locally sewn with upcycled cotton materials, but um, I've just been collecting them and just taking them to our box and it's pretty big. So feel free to stop by the store and drop anything off that you find. Stephanie, can you say the name of the grocery store again that's in down, near downtown LA for everyone? It's called Tear, T-A-R-E. I think it's Tear Grocer. Um, and yeah, that's the only local one that I know of that has a really wide selection of bulk foods for now. Okay, well, thank you so much. Meredith and Stephanie for sharing with us this evening. Next webinar is going to be on October 22nd and it follows really well on our last conversation because we are going to have um, a speaker from UCLA who will be sharing with us ways to reduce our carbon footprint by greening what we eat. She has researched the carbon impact of various foods, the production of various foods. And so she's going to be offering tips and suggestions for how to make a few simple changes in your pantry to significantly reduce your carbon footprint. Um, and then you can see on the screen the other upcoming webinars. And again, we encourage you to join us for those. Um, also, uh, resources that you can use to educate yourself about these important issues, some actions that you can personally take to um, improve your relationship with the environment. And most importantly, particularly now in this election season, to advocate on behalf of our planet. And I think it's really important to stress that as far as we can go with the individual actions that we take, we have to look at collective action. We are seeing how climate change is a global issue and all of the effects, if this pandemic hasn't convinced us, I don't know that anything will, that we are all interconnected and we have to act together. So whether you support an environmental group, whether you support an environmental advocacy, cast your vote for green candidates, research green candidates, support green candidates, it's, 
it's all in our hands. It's up for up to us to be the change that we want to see taken. And um, I will finish with a quote before our final giveaway from Greta Thornburg, who said, if we are to have a small chance, the climate crisis needs to be our main focus. So with that from a young person who is looking at us to fight her fight, it's time for giveaway number three. And our final giveaway winner is number 30. So our super behind the scenes, behind the scenes, people will figure out who number 30 is. And here is what you are winning from the Wasteless Shop. This is a stain remover bar, which Stephanie, correct me if I'm wrong, but should last anywhere from six months to a year. And then this is the free and clear laundry detergent in a refillable bottle. Um, of course, you can bring in your own larger bottle to refill, but this is one to get you started. So these two items are our third giveaway and the winner is Wendy Vardman. I hope I said that right. Wendy Vardman, the detergent and the soap are yours. So with that, I think it's time to close our webinar and again, invite all of you to join us on October 22nd. And thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to be with us. Thanks and bye-bye.